Good afternoon, everybody, and a very warm welcome to episode 10 of Lessons in Leadership. I'm Mary Gregory. This is a special Christmas Eve edition. Uh, we've moved our slot from Friday to Thursday this week to celebrate Christmas with you on Christmas Eve. And I can't think of a better person to celebrate it with than my guest today, who is Oliver Johnson. Hello, Oliver. Hi, Mary. Glad to be here. Oh, it's lovely to have you here. And Oliver and I have known each other for many, many years. Um, we used to work at Penner together in the talent consulting division. And Oliver was director of leadership at that time. And I was very pleased to be part of your team, actually. We had some great times in those days, didn't we? Yeah, we did. Yeah, yeah. So... So Oliver knows a lot about leadership. He's uh, he's cer you've certainly been around the block with it, haven't you, uh, Oliver, in terms of coaching and developing leadership mm -hmm. programs for all sorts of senior teams. And now um, you are coming to a stage in your career where you've set up a new, it's kind of a new career for you in that you've set up stepping out from the top team, which is all about supporting senior executives who are on the board to take their next step towards maybe not retirement, but the next stage of their life and maybe the next stage of their working life. So um, would you like to share with us today um, a bit of a background as to how you've got to be where you are and, and, and what stepping out from the top team is all about? Yes, delighted to. Um, so first of all, it's Christmas Eve and I love Christmas Eve. Actually, I, I love this bit of the winter. Uh, I think from that sort of ancient sense of the winter solstice, then into Yule tide and the festivals and the and the feasting and stuff, and then onto the threshold of the new year. I just yes, think it's a nice time. But it's a particularly important day for me today. Um, I'm 68. I um, this year I celebrated the 50th year of my career, so I've had a 50 year long career. Um, but today is also the day that I hang up my boots and finish my coaching practice. Wow. Um, it's important it's an important day and a celebration for me so it's great to be with you on a day like today oh this is fantastic and thank you for joining us on such an important day as well oliver i'm really touched that you're here it's fantastic congratulations so um linked to stepping out um i mean i'm 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 retiring from oliver johnson coach facilitator teacher but i'm not retiring to the sofa and daytime television I'm, I'm retiring to projects, um, so I, I'll spend more time with my family. I've got travel projects, collecting projects, new learning projects. You know, I've lots of things to do, but I've one piece of unfinished professional business, which was stepping out from the top team. And stepping out from the top team, we um, help senior leaders to step out of the executive suite successfully. And uh, we launched it in September with fifteen of uh, of of fifteen really good uh, accredited coaches, and uh, we're focused on that. So that will keep me busy um, into next year and beyond. Um, but with plenty of time to do all of the other things that I want to do now that I've reached this stage. So um, and actually that links to um, that whole sense of going after a busy career. The idea of doing less and doing it better becomes a very attractive idea. I'm mm. wondering for quite a long time. Mm. So doing things less, doing it better, that sounds intriguing. And you've got coaches set up to support senior executives that are moving out of the top team. And does that mean that you're leading that, but you're not coaching yourself? I will be coaching because the, the reason I decided to, to uh, finish my coaching practice uh, was two reasons. One, that I always promised myself I would stop before anybody else thought I should, right? And I thought in the mainstream of, um, you know, business and, and working at the senior level, this was the right time to do that. Yes. Secondly, I love coaching so much. I love what I do. But I realized it was stopping me going on to do the other things because it kept getting in the way of the other things that were not. Yes. Yes. So it was, uh, so those are my reasons. But I also, I would really miss this sort of a conversation. I would miss coaching people. So I've narrowed it down to a much, a much more narrow focus, which is specifically on people who are thinking about when do I step out from my senior role? Yes. And, yes. and yeah. I, 
I've worked with 150, more than 150 senior executives on that journey. And it's a tricky journey for many people. So yes. we're there to support that. Yes. And so what sort of things are you supporting people with when you say it's a tricky journey? What makes it tricky for senior executives to leave their very responsible roles on the board or whatever? What are the things that you find you are coaching them on? Well, I mean, I think very often people know that sometimes they, they discover it. But we get very attached to our labels. We earn labels. And especially as we get to the top of our careers, we go, you know, chief finance officer or, you know, senior, such and such or whatever. And the idea of thinking about giving those up, you know, you know, the, the, the what do you call postman, Pat, when he's no longer a postman? Yes. So, so it's about identity that comes with the role. And, and I'm also hearing a certain amount of status as well. Yeah. Even the word chief kind of gives you a certain status, doesn't it? And so letting that go can be quite hard and for many people it's not it's not that they consciously are aware of how important that is it's only when they go to let it go and just become pat or the postman pat, that that they start to feel it so there's that there's a second thing is lots of people i reckon 85 percent of people that we work with uh, so far don't know how to do it how do you actually go about going i've got a busy full-on uh you know very rewarding job that I do very well. Yes. I, I, how do I actually go about finding the exit door and then yes. get the beyond? Um, and the other thing is just a sense of, it's one of those things that people tend to go, well, I must think about this, but maybe tomorrow. So mm. when Anna Manana comes the thing. That yeah, they, yeah, um, yeah. They realize five years later that they should have been planning this for five years and it's now facing them as an immediate thing so yes. so we try to get involved quite far upstream this isn't outplacement this isn't uh you know when people know they're leaving this is to go when would be the right time let me introduce you to the goldilocks dilemma which is for seniors yes you can leave too early which means you leave before the job is done you can leave too late which means you hang on like the unwanted last guest at a party yeah <laughs> just the right time and that work to get it just right, which is how do, how do I get clear about what I'm going on to do and be excited by that? Yeah. What do I need to do to finish this role off well, make sure I secure my legacy, make sure I honour my responsibilities and actually get it just right, not just for me, but for the organisation as well. Yes. One of the things we've learned recently is... Um, I became aware of is this notion that most organizations only focus on one half of the succession equation. So the succession equation, the, the bit that they focus on is how do we get people ready to succeed? How do we get people to, to be bench ready to move into the senior roles? Uh, the second half of the equation is how do we create the spaces in this in the executive suite for those people to move into? Mm. Do that positively. So stepping out is a positive is a positive thing. It's about saying stepping out is a liberation. It's about freeing yourself up to do other things, doing it at the right time. We get that happening purposely. So that yes. we move into the top team. So that's yeah. right. And I'm glad say great so so the thing that's coming up for me as you're talking then it sounds incredibly positive and i love the goldilocks description as well uh, and and the journey that people have to go through in order that it's a proactive step yeah. um not just looking after the individual executive but thinking about the whole team and bringing people through the organization here's a query i have and it might be related to you know i'm thinking you know i'm reaching an age where i don't feel i want to retire um, I can see, my, I love what I do. So I'm kind of thinking I can go on and do this for a lot longer, particularly doing it much more virtually as well. How do you deal with someone who really is in denial of wanting to discuss, you know, they just don't want to just talk about it. They don't want to entertain it. How would you approach that with somebody um, or, or support somebody in their organization who needs to have that conversation with them? Yeah, I mean, I think there's, a, there's an organizational dimension to that, which is we, we help and support organizations get their right policy right. Because it needs to be not connected to age discrimination. Mm. 
be positive. It needs to be something that people can buy into. But then it also needs to be people's choice. If it's not people's choice um, as to what they do, then it becomes enforced. So there is something about creating the conditions where I, I know one chief, uh, one chief people officer who, who said to me, you know, on our team, um, everybody knows that stepping out at the right time is not a request, it's a requirement. You're expected to do it. And we talk about it and we support it because we need it. That's a great context. Yeah. Um, and I, I, you know, if, if people are very resistant to it, we wouldn't be forcing coaching onto them. Yes. We go. But actually, there is one other organization that I work with, and they have a, a policy that 54 everyone is expected to enter into conversation about the remainder of the career. Not yes. saying when will that end or whatever, but to go, now we need to start managing this process, whether yes. that's two years time, five years time or 10 years time. So I think that can help to set the scene as well. Yes. So, and, you know. so there's something about the culture, having it as part of the culture of how we do things around here, but also it becomes a normal everyday part of the conversation um that this is an expectation of of what will happen a bit like i suppose many years ago succession planning wasn't so much talked about was it as it is now and and leaders are all, all leaders in big or bigger organizations certainly they've got their strategy sorted out will be talking about succession planning as a normal part of what they do and i suppose this is another level on that conversation because it's taking you into well what's next for you in the next stage of your life not just your career as well and, and i do think when when it's set up in the right way uh, or when individuals go i really should start thinking about this yes the focus that, that we take is on going what is the liberation in this yes so what is it you want to be free from and at the moment you have a lot of people saying i've had a chance to be home for six months and I've realized how much I love that. And I see the idea of getting back onto the commute and the airports, et cetera, is actually something that I really, I'm now really I don't want to do. So yes. I'm be free from, yes. it's also like free too. So uh, I've spent the last 10 weeks um, in Tenerife um, because I can. And, and, you know, increasingly, I've got the freedom to do what I choose to do in the way I choose to do it. Um, yes. That's a liberation now um when i was in my sort of full-on career i couldn't do that but the prospect of going there will be a point that i can do it it's actually a mm. quite liberating idea and then putting the work in to go right how do i get there how do i get yes. to that? Oh, whatever is the right time for me yes and there's something there about you what you're talking about is the autonomy and the freedom so you've been in tenerife for six weeks or whatever and um, you, you've got the freedom to choose to do that, but you've still been doing work out there as well. So I'm also getting there's something around, just because your circumstances are changing, you may not be leading a big organization anymore, or you may not be running around busy servicing big organizations or whatever, because you're, you know, in your case, you're, you're stepping out of your role, but there's something around your, you can still do, activity you talk about projects and it has purpose and meaning for you and that and that is fulfilling is what i'm hearing absolutely i mean i i the idea of sitting on the sofa watching daytime TV, it just fills me with dread yes uh, so i need to be active and i just i've always been motivated to engage with other people and to be in that privileged position of being for example a coach Yes. What motivates me about that? Just because I retire doesn't mean that won't be there. Yeah. So what's how do I fulfill that? Um so there's something very nice about being in Tenerife. My son lives in Tenerife, so we more you know, Rosie comes out with my wife and we've got more time to spend there. Um, but also I can coach people perfectly well or whatever. And I say that finishes today, but then the stepping out coaching will continue. But also yes. the finder of that and the the promotion. Yes. And, uh, and getting people to realise that it's an important thing that's worth considering. Yes, excellent. And I'm also hearing how um, 
I'm getting a sense of you really narrowing your niche through moving into the next stage. It's like, right, I'm not doing any of that anymore. I am doing this. And it's like getting to that tip of the arrow that this is exactly the specific thing I will be doing that I find fulfilling. And it's it, it represents me and expresses me and my purpose. So I, I spoke to my, my financial advisor, who's a friend of mine, uh, years ago, said, well, are you going to retire? And I said, well, I probably will at some stage. And I said, are you going to retire? And he said, well, I will, but I don't intend to any time soon. But what I'm doing is I'm, I'm giving away all the things I don't like doing and only retaining the things I like doing. He owns his own business, so he can do yes. it. That's yeah. a really clever thing to do. Yeah. Uh, um, and, I mean, you were saying there about um, you, know, you love what you're doing. Um, some people are fortunate, and I would put you on eye on that, that we've already run away and joined the circus. You know, yes. We're already yes. doing the thing we dream to do. Yeah. So there's no urgency in stopping. Yes. There's a point when inevitably we all stop doing it. But so we've got plenty of time. But we can also, if if retirement is not a date in the calendar, it's a process, then we can have different phases of it. So I went yeah. from full on to four days a week, then uh, left the PLC, set up my own coaching practice, which was three days a week. And now you know, finishing that and stepping out would be two days a week within five days to do all of the other things. So it is a process. Of yes. Better. Yeah. And it sounds like a really gifted life, actually. And in so doing, you're able to still keep passing your gifts on to others as well, which is wonderful. Mm. So, so um, you know, Oliver, you're a seasoned leader. You have been around a bit. You've learned lots and lots of lessons along the way you know part of what I always ask my guests um, at this point in the conversation is to share some sort of story that was like a really important moment for you and I'm sure you must have many so I should imagine it's quite hard to select just one but I'd really love to hear what has what has really influenced you and impacted you in how you lead your life and and how you lead and are a leader um, that still shows up today um, well, it's it's an idea that I adopted 25 years ago, and it's helped sort of guide me for the, for the 25 years and hopefully the next years. I probably won't buy it own 30 years. But, um, and it, it's the term less but better. Yeah. Um, and the idea that in a world where there's constantly more and too much, and you know, that the notion of less but better really affected me and i don't remember the first moment i got interested in it, but i do remember but but i i uh, that term left the better comes from dieter rams who was the um chief designer at braun uh, who made the coolest products particularly in the 70s that it was like the apple products of the noughties in the 70s and they were beautifully designed very functional very elegant and his left but better got him to that, got to, mm. to that. Because uh, you look at it, you look at something and go, what are all the things here that aren't necessary? Let's strip those away. You have to only focus on the things that really add value and then perfect those and make them really good. Uh, and that notion of less but better is shared um, across lots of different professions in the design world. So you had in architecture, you had Reese van der Rohe with less is more. Um, you had Picasso with Art is the elimination of the unnecessary, again, strip things away. Uh, you had Coco Chanel, um, whose maxim was never add, always subtract, which is where the little black dress came from. Mm. The embellishments take away the needless frilly bits and expose the elegant simplicity. So mm. we're getting out of there. And there is a story about uh, John Lennon, um, who um, he had been a Beatle, he was then had done his own career he took five years off and when he was coming back into the recording studio uh, he put a, a band together of the best of the session musicians around some of his friends and one of the session musicians was tony levin who was a brilliant bass guitarist and he had never met john Lennon, so he turned up in the morning of the the recording sessions and uh, he introduced uh, john and maybe mr Lennon, i don't know i am um, delighted with I just hope I'm good enough. And he said, John Lennon looked at me and he said, I know you're very good. Just don't play too many notes. 
Wow. Okay. Okay. We just want really good basic stuff um, and, you know, and stuff. Uh, so it's, it's very well said. My idea of less but better and how it's affected my life is actually based on the notion that we live our lives, in my case, like overstuffed drawers. I will certainly, and I think many people do. Mm. Uh, for me, a drawer is full when it's got lots of stuff in it, but you can still close it easily and you can still find out, you can still find what you're looking for in it. Mm. Most of us go way beyond that. So our lives become like a chest of overstuffed drawers mm. where you cram so much into it, you can't get the door closed, you can't find out what's in it. And if you do that for too long, you break the drawer or the mm. drawer. I mean, it's mm. a pretty sort of, you know, um, interesting idea. And that goes for, I mean, how I've used that is in the stuff of my life. So just, you know, the stuff that comes into your life, the possessions and the, the stuff. And you look at it today, and most people, or a lot of people, stuff their, their homes full of stuff. Then if they're lucky enough to have a garage, the overflow goes and stuffs the garage. And then if you look at the, the increase in personal storage, you know, they then go, I have enough space here. We must, you know, then spend money on the storage unit. Yeah. And you go, hold on a minute. It's another point to stop and go, if we had less, could we make what we end up with better and improve it? So it's an idea for just the stuff of your life. It's also, in terms of, I hate the term personal management, but most of us, when we're living busy lives, have too long to-do lists, have too many emails coming in and out, have um, you know, too many priorities, too many change projects, too many whatever. Too and much communication. I <laughs> just think about social media, it all being Yeah, and all that noise of social media. Yeah. Um and the point of going, no, hold on a minute. What is it that's the essential elements of this? Let me focus on that and then the Yeah. Well, so give so, me one example, Mary, which is uh, I'm finishing off my, you know, in my coaching career. I have a library or had a library of every Harvard review for the last 20 years and like 1,500 books. I gave them all away, which was a hard thing to do. But they, just, they weren't serving me anymore. I didn't need them anymore. And they just, yeah. became, those are the sort of things I think we need to do. You're saying about having to be unattached to do that though, Oliver. You must have felt, because I can think about, you know, I've got a lot of books and yeah there's some I could give away but there's others that I would find really hard to give away because I'm attached to them so how do you deal with the attachment element well you see I, I think um in my experience I was attached to my books um I was also attached to things I tried to clear out my shock sock drawer at one point and I picked up a pair of socks I wrote my daughter Kate and I went to Iceland and I was wearing these socks they've got cement I got they're only a pair of bloody socks <laughs> So it's like it's like dissociate from the emotional attachment is what it's about. Uh, yeah. So uh, Condo Maria Marie Condo says, thank your possessions for serving you and then let them go. Very good. That's a nice yeah, one. I like that. It's quite a hard thing to do. I'm certainly yeah. the library. Now I did keep books that had a real emotional resonance for me. Yeah. But but yes. 1,500 books and all the Harvard reviews went. And I'm I'm enjoying the space that they've left. I bet a breathing space I should imagine so how does that how does this less but better how do you apply that to leadership I can see it in your sock drawer and I can see it on your bookshelves how does it show up in terms of leadership what's the application there Oliver well I think for those of us uh, who are leaders you can ask the question are you caught in the weeds are you pulled down into all the details mm. The definition of leadership is um, its derivation is from um, journey, and leadership is about taking people on a journey to the future. If we get stuck in the weeds, if we get stuck in the detail, that doesn't happen. So there's a real requirement, and I would have noticed it in the people I've coached, the very best leaders and most senior leaders are brilliant at going, what can only I do? And then make sure that everybody else is doing their job so everything gets done but they most leaders do the job one level below them yeah and you will notice that if you ever hear yourself saying god i was such a busy week and i didn't get any of the things that i needed to get done done 
as sure as anything, if you're leading a team, you're doing other people's jobs and not mm-hmm. your own. So mm-hmm. The idea of having the, the, the ability to go, this is my job, this is what I do, and not get caught up in all of this. So it's less to do, but I can do it better. That is a really, I, I, that is such good advice and so, a profound insight, actually, because, you know, I work with leaders and frequently it's about how can they step up and be more strategic and struggling with how do I let go of all, all that operational stuff that I keep getting caught up with. So I really love that as the analogy, less but better. And if you're not doing less but better, then you're being too involved in the finite and in the and in the detail excellent there, there is mary there is um general stanley mccrystal um who led special forces in the, in the united states um army who's a very smart guy um and i don't normally like military analogies but it's just he is so smart that he has a maxim which is eyes on hands off so he says as a leader you watch everything you are really well educated in what's going on but you don't follow that by getting involved in everything. You go, first of all, the default is hands off. People are there to do that. Uh, let me support them, but let them do it. And his the thing is then, but if you do then have to intervene, you get time to do it so you can do it well. So yeah. I like that idea. Of eyes I love that. I love that. I'm going to write that down. That's really, really, um, I can think of a lot of clients I can share that with. Actually, that's a great one. So as we, we're going to be concluding shortly and, you know, we're reaching Christmas. It's Christmas Eve today. We're all about to enter into a celebration period and and and, and, and potentially overindulgence. So maybe we need to be thinking about less but better over this festive period. But what what advice do you want to leave people with, particularly thinking about moving into 2021 after such a challenging year of 2020? I, I think I think first of all, Mary, I, I I I find less can sit very well with more. I don't think they have to be opposites all the time. So I fully intend to live the next few days of of the feasting and having more than enough. And I'm <laughs> with that. But there comes a point of going. That's not all. That's not always the case. There's a balance to that the less but better. Um, I mean, I think I I listen to people and i know i used to do it which was you get to this time of year you're standing in the threshold of the next year and you go, i'm going to do a plan so you make this really long to-do list of all the things you need to do and want to do and you then pose that huge long to-do list on top of all the other to-do lists that you're struggling with anyway and then none of them ever get done uh, a couple of years ago i started started to do something different which has worked for me well and might be of interest to other people which is instead of doing that um i ask myself the question how do i want to feel when i wake up in the morning in 2021 right? so every morning how do i want to feel and then saying what are the f- the fewest number of things i need to do to get to feel like that and those are both things of addition like so what do i need to add or do more of but also what do i need to subtract what do i need to give away stop doing so i can feel like that um and so i i, I hope that might be relevant to people just i think i love that you're making me think i'm thinking gosh yeah because it's so you know we make all these new year's resolutions at this time of year and by you know middle of january or end of january they've all gone by the by but i love the idea of how do I want to feel when I wake up? And therefore, what do I need to do to make sure that I I feel that? Is a really, sim- again, simple, less but better way of thinking about it and, pl- and creating your future for you on a day-by-day basis. Yeah. Oliver, it has been absolutely delightful to talk to you today. Thank you so much for all your wisdom and your insights. I hope you have an absolutely wonderful Christmas and New Year. And I look forward to hearing more about how um, Stepping Out From Top Team gets on and and keep sharing that on uh, Facebook and LinkedIn. Keep sharing your journey. Do enjoy the next stage. And uh, yeah, we'll we'll be in touch. So we'll stay in touch. That's great. So I'm going to say thank you to everybody else as well. If you're not watching today and you're watching in in catch up, do make your comments and and keep the conversation going um, by Uh, posting your comments on this Facebook uh, live video. But in the meantime, I'm now going to say it is coming up to Christmas celebration time. 
I'm signing off now until the 8th of January. Our next Lessons in Leadership will be back on the 8th of January. Do join us then. We've got another wonderful set of guests joining us in the new year, and we'll be sending more information about that nearer the time. In the meantime, everyone enjoy the festive season. Less is better, but still keep enjoying it. And we'll see you in 2021. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.